at the far end of the ground floor part of the Living Heritage Exhibition at the Bar Convent, you can see copies of the 50 large paintings known as the Painted Life of Mary Ward, created sometime in the second half of the 17th century. Sent from Rome to Munich and later to Augsburg, they've had a checkered history. Exhibited in passages, banished to attics by angry bishops who were fiercely against anything that encouraged devotion to Mary Ward, they were preserved during World War II in a country house belonging to the Fugger family from destruction by Allied bombs that wiped out the entire Institute House in Augsburg. Now they hang in a large hall in the rebuilt Augsburg School. I speak of the mystery of the painted life for several reasons. Why was it painted? Was it for the benefit of younger members who had not known Mary Ward? Was it to present her in a positive light when the Institute was still suppressed? We shall never know for certain. Who commissioned the paintings? It's reasonable to suppose that Mary Ward and Winifred Wigmore, the last survivors of the First Companions, had the idea. They were with Mary Ward when she died in Heworth and were members of the group that went from York to Paris in 1650. It was probably one of the more peaceful stages in their lives. Away from Rome and Middle Europe where the storm had broken out over the Bull of Suppression and away from the other turmoil of Civil War England. What more natural than that the two old friends should have thought about how to hand on knowledge of our dearest mother of happy memory, to quote the opening words of the brief relation, the first written life of Mary Ward, for which they were also responsible. Mary Points became the third chief superior after Barbara Babthorpe died in 1653, so would have had the authority to commission paintings. In Rome, she would have known the frescoes of the life of St. Francis of Rome in the Torre dei Specchi convent, where Barbara Ward had died. In Munich and Augsburg, she would have known something of the tradition of votive pictures in places like the Shrine Chapel in Alterting, where people prayed for special graces and often offered pictures illustrating the giving of them. Who painted the pictures? Art experts say that at least five artists were involved, some very skilled, some less so. If we look at these two pictures here, we see on the left, the picture of Christmas Eve, 1626 at Feldkirch in Tyrol, when Mary Ward and Mary Points and companions were traveling from Rome into Germany. Animated, various groups doing various different things. Look at the people on the left-hand side, for example, talking to each other, sharing gossip evidently, the priests, the servers, the three devoutly holding candles, and the important figures for us, the four sisters in their habits. Then we look on the right, and there is a picture of Mary Ward talking to a novice in danger of losing her vocation. Stiff figures, evidently left-hand artist, more skilled than the one on the right, who is much more in the Shrine Chapel tradition. It's also thought that some of the artists may have come from Flanders, some from South Germany, some from Rome. It's impossible to know for certain. 
none of the artists seems to be to have been anyone well known. And why these particular incidents? They certainly do not add up to a life in the usual sense. The last piece of external incident is the journey to music, Munich at the end of 1626, and huge areas are not covered. Much of her childhood, her earlier religious life as a poor Clare, the founding of communities and schools, the suppression of the Institute and her imprisonment, the return to Rome, the last period in England. The choice of the journey to Munich is significant. It's an animated picture. Notice the hands, particularly the coachman pointing forward. And notice the man on the white horse, uh, very visible in the middle, who is raising his hand to his cap and evidently waving to someone. Very much people on a journey. Notice also the light over the coach, indicating a favour from God. And it recalls an upbeat, successful stage. The four years or so in which the foundations in Munich, Vienna and Pressburg were made before the dark period of arrest and suppression. What we can say positively is that we have in these pictures the story of Mary's inner vocation and spiritual journey and some key points about the nature of the Institute. So let us trace this story. First, we have something of her childhood in Yorkshire, which it's clear that the artists had never seen. This one, Mary's first word. The foreign artist had a general idea that she was a noble lady and imagined her surroundings accordingly. The Mulwith farmhouse was never like that. But let us look closely at what the designer of the life wants to show us. It's the significance of the name Jesus in her life. Again, the last words of the brief relation say, the dearness of her love to the holy name of Jesus was as to a thing that had or was to cost her dear. So, the first slide is a keynote picture. Notice the centrality of the little figure of Mary Ward. Poised, calm, though her mother has just evidently been afraid of her falling as she toddled out from her bedroom in the back centre. But notice the two servants sorting clothes to the right, a normal only feminine scene. We know the story. The mother says, Jesus, save my child. And Mary says, Jesus. Then nothing more for some time. Perhaps the raised hand of the fourth woman, the servant behind the mother, is saying to us, take note of this. The end of the series will be this slide. At Saint-Omer, evidently on the way to England in 1639, Jesus is with Mary saying to her, be not weary, you shall die soon and your reward shall be great. The second theme is the drama of conflict between God's designs and the possibility of worldly advancement. So there's a strong featuring of marriage proposals. Here we see the first from Redshaw when she was 10, and the third from Eldrington when she was 13. Notice 
two features of artistic convention and the painted life. The telling of the story in separate scenes, as in a modern strip cartoon. Here, for example, the party arriving, the two young people meeting, Mary telling her father, no, this won't do, can't manage him. And then, and it's sad that the faces of the participants in the meeting are covering the whole picture of Mary Ward and her father departing into the sunset in the Yorkshire countryside. And notice also the hands that are being used to make points. And notice also the white dress, which you will find grows as she grows picture by picture. I can never look at the marriage proposal scenes without thinking of the Chisha Washer play back in the fourth centenary of Mary Ward's going to St. Omer, we had a jubilee. And that same August, I was invited to Chisha Washer to do some work with the sisters. And at that time, they had a wonderful jubilee mass in which we all processed in dancing and singing in true African fashion. And in the course of the mass, the six form girls who are the responsibility of our sisters who have a hostel for them, were by way of doing a play about Mary Ward. With all the, the con-celebrating clergy fortunately behind, stuffing handkerchiefs in their mouths because they were so amused by the whole thing. Because it all focused on the marriage proposals in which a young man would turn up and Mary would say, oh no, I, can, I can't possibly think of marrying you. I can only love Jesus. And this happened three times round. So marriage proposals, no, no. In fact, Mary Ward in her fragments of autobiography says that she didn't refuse the early proposals because she was thinking of a religious vocation, but at the time, simply because she didn't care for the young man in question. There are other dramas, for example, this of The Fire in Mulwith, another cartoon series in which we have Mary and two of her sisters caught in the burning house and put into a safe place they can hide under for the moment and praying. Then evidently, little brother says, Daddy, look, the girls are still in the house. And then Marmaduke Ward looking big and safe and reliable is leading the girls out. And you could say another example of a foreign artist not knowing Yorkshire. The next one, known as the devil on horseback, is the time when Mary is 10 and she's preparing for her, her first communion with Catherine Arthington, her mother's cousin, who lived in the farmhouse in Harewell. Not a bit like this. A messenger comes from Mary's father, as he says, reading a letter which the father has written to tell Mary not to make her first communion after all because her father has other plans. Then he refuses to leave the letter, goes away, leaving Mary in some distress. Remember, she's a 10 year old. She has nobody to turn to. She can't really discuss this with Catherine Arlington, or so she thinks, but she's anxious because this is so unlike her father. If she does what the letter has said, well, what's going to happen to her father's reputation as a good Catholic man? And she's distressed and she's disturbed and she can't even pray. God seems to be rebuking her as well. So she makes 
as we would say, a fairly simple kind of discernment. She looks at the facts about her father. She looks at where God seems to be leading her. And she decides she's going to take no notice, go ahead and make her first communion. And confirmation of her choice is found in her prayer, which then is all right. The clouds go away and she's back to normal. And later it's discovered that the letter didn't come from the father at all. And here we have her happily making her first Holy Communion in the white dress. And we see her in a series of scenes making her first confession at the mass, receiving communion, praying afterwards and note the figure, which is not Mary having a vision, but it is a sign that there is divine communication. She is in prayer with God after this longed for occasion. So not a vision, but a special prayer moment. And then we come to a very central theme, the third important theme, the development of her vocation. Here she's in another of the places that she lived in, Yorkshire. She had a most extraordinary childhood, as we know, constantly being sent off to other relations, maybe because the family is growing and mother has too many other things to do and the eldest is big enough to be allowed to be with other people. Maybe it has to do with her meeting eligible young men, getting more social experience because she was a shy child. We don't know, but anyway, this is the fact. So, age 15, she's in Osgoodby, between York and Selby, and she's with the Babthorpe family. So here she is with Barbara Babthorpe, to become in later life a loyal friend and supporter of Mary's venture, and in fact her successor as head, chief superior of what remains of Mary's institute after the suppression. But here, that's all far in the future, and the two girls are sitting sewing with Margaret Garrett, an old servant. And Margaret is telling a story about religious life in former times when there were allowed to be religious houses in England. And Mary is impressed because it's the story of a young sister who has done something disgraceful and is punished by being daily humiliated by the community who are to walk over her as they go into the refectory. And Mary is impressed by the high standards that there must be in religious life if somebody does something disgraceful and keeps on being punished for it. And you can see Mary appears to have dropped her needlework box. She's not sewing, she's listening raptly to Margaret. It's not Barbara's moment, so she just gets on with the sewing. Maybe she's a bit bored by it anyway. But we notice again the light which is evidently pointed at Mary, a moment of God communicating with her. And notice part of the domestic scene. We have another servant and what looks like no, I think that's probably another woman servant, not a man servant at all. So this is the beginning of Mary seriously beginning to think of her future vocation. And of course, she is 17th century, we would now say teenager. She's living at a time when the church is persecuted, forbidden in England, and we know there were many, many martyrs, very often priests, but others too. Heads put on 
a tower to warn other people not to do the same things as they've been doing and the rather grisly details of the punishment. And Mary surrounded by instruments of torture and going away and praying about it all. Not unnatural that at such a time she might think seriously, is that the kind of thing God is planning for me? But no, that's not what God wants. It's going to be religious life. Notice there appears to be some C, so this is indicating the need to cross to the continent. And notice the path stretching in front of her as she goes to what may be the Poor Clare convent which she first enters. But, of course, there's still time to be spent in England. And here the family is deeply opposed because there has been the final and most attractive and most influential offer of marriage from Edmund Neville, Earl to the heir, heir to the Earl of Westmoreland, and he has proposed to Mary. And again, notice the hands, the confessor, the Jesuit Father Richard Hope is saying, now you have to think this and this and this. First of all, this would be so much more to the advantage of the Catholic cause than merely you entering a religious community. Mary is saying, shan't. Mother is saying, but listen, darling. And the two men at the sides are father, evidently, and either a brother, not Edmund Neville himself, but this is the option going on, and there is Mary, again, praying about the whole thing. And then the Mass in Baldwin's Gardens. Now we've had the gunpowder plot. Catholic England is in total disarray. Possibly Mary has, and her mother have come to London to see what's happened to her father who has been arrested on account of the plot. And we notice among all these men, there is nobody who looks like the Marmaduke ward we've seen in other pictures. And the priest spills the chalice, is convinced this is a sign from God and that he must no longer oppose Mary's vocation. But she evidently is given permission by her father and she sets off to saint Omer, center for English refu Catholic refugees going to the continent about their faith. And this is all that we are shown of Mary's first attempt at religious life with the poor Clares in St. Omer. That and the vow to Father Roger Lee, her confessor, that she will go back to England and there she will do apostolic work for souls and see how God leads her. Notice she's got a black dress by now. The long-suffering white dress has come to the end of its part in her story because now something else. And so we see the fourth series of pictures, the call to another way. Here she's at Coldham Hall in Norfolk over the Rookwood family. And first of all, we see Mary succeeding where Many learned men, some of whom are in the doorway, have failed to persuade a heretic woman to see a priest, be reconciled with the church and die in the odor of sanctity. 
This is evidently Susanna looking on and being impressed by Mary. Here is Mary going to the priest, explaining about the woman and the priest hearing the woman's confession. And here we have a family meal of the Rookwood family. The figure here is thought to be Susanna. Notice you can see something still of the, the green overdress and the red arm that we've seen in the previous picture. Susanna slipping a note to her father saying, I want to go off with this lady, Mary Ward. I'm very impressed by what she's trying to do. And then we come to her mission in London here, the story of Mary borrowing a dress from her servant, going in disguise through the streets so as not to be noticed as a noble lady on foot going through the streets, where is she going? Notice the London streets were not like that in 1609. Again, the foreign artist doesn't know. But here is Mary meeting and making an appointment with the lady that she wants to see who is apparently a relation of hers called Miss Gray, who has her turn to be in a white dress. Here is Mary at the serious appointment and she is convincing Miss Gray that she too must be reconciled with the church. And here, and this is maybe an argument for this series of paintings having to do with something to be shown to younger sisters. A warning about the potential dangers of apostolic life. Because here, out in the world, available to making all kinds of contacts, Mary has evidently made contact with some noble young man who has got interested and is sending her a collation of fine food, which Mary suspects, apparently with some justice, of being an inappropriate form of approach to her. And here she's praying and possibly even doing penance. Prays all night, but she'll manage to get through this dangerous situation, which she does. And here we have the famous glory vision, one of her most notable graces. Still in London, while dressing after a cold and distracted meditation, suddenly she has an intense spiritual experience and notice the quantities of light coming down on her lasts about two hours and she sees in it very clearly that she's not to enter an enclosed order but to do something else which will be much more to the glory of God. For a long time she's aware of nothing but the words glory, glory, glory. She's still not shown what the new thing is going to be but this is the turning point. And here we have the companions. And this effectively is the icon of Mary Ward's Institute because the two most important features of it are the being companions. And notice the companions sitting in a circle Notice the lively talk that's going on as the hands move and the face is turn. And Mary is sitting perfectly still and listening to what all the others are talking about. And then, of course, a meal together is part of the experience. And then here they are setting off in the boat, 
going off on mission for the first time to send to Mayor where they're going to begin a school for English girls and pray and do penance and wait and find out what is God's will for them. So we have Mary in the boat, two others in the boat, possibly Barbara Babsorp, waiting to be taken across. And this one, seen in both pictures, is very probably Mary Points. And that's interesting because in real life, at this stage, Mary Points is about six and she's being taken off to be a pupil in the school. But of course, at the time that the paintings are commissioned, she is the general superior and the important. And somebody or other, probably not her, thinks she should be featured as part of the scene right from the beginning. Incidentally, looking at the boat, when we look at the whole series on the wall, we'll see several pictures involving travel. Three ships, two carriages, two riding horses. Is this also part of the apostolic message that if you are a follower of Mary Ward, it's definitely not about staying in one place and being enclosed. It's all about being on the road, being on mission, being with people. And of course, the being among people we've already seen. So we come then to the Mary Ward Institute way. Already prepared in what we've seen in the last couple of pictures, but confirmed in the slide in which Mary has the pivotal spiritual experience which confirms her and tells her, take the same of the society, the society of Jesus. Father General will never permit it, go to him. And she says later, these are the words whose worth cannot be valued, nor the good they contain too dearly bought. These gave sight where there was none, made known what God would have done. If ever I be worthy to do anything more about this institute, hither I must come to draw. The call was and is to take the same, both in matter and manner, that only accepted, which God by diversity of sex had prohibited to follow St. Ignatius's way. She's still confined to her room, having had a fairly serious illness, but she's getting better. She's dressed, she's, she says in her telling of the incident that she's in some peace and clarity and calmness of mind. And it's at this point that an insight comes from God. Notice she is within the four poster bed. She's not seeing anything. This is something, again, intellectually understood. And you could say it's an example of how God works through real life experience, because all her life, Mary has been ministered to by Jesuits. They're in close contact this particular time with the Jesuits in saint Omer, and now she sees clearly this is the way. And then, of course, there is the experience, which is an experience of meditation. She's making a retreat, and in the course of this, she has the vision, what is known as the vision of the just soul. It seems a clear and perfect state to be had in this life, 
a singular freedom from all that would make one adhere to earthly things, the freedom to refer all to God. And then we have, again, in the retreat prayer, confirmation of the apostolic way which she is now convinced they must embark upon. But she's praying about, again, the possible calls. And so we see traditional religious life for men and women. We see, again, the way of martyrdom. And we see <clears throat> the motley collection of people of all sorts who are the people in the world. And we see figures ministering to these people, an apostolic looking figure, this figure who is possibly even Jesus himself. We see a woman teaching a group of children. And it is this life, the life among people, life in the world, life of activity, which Mary is convinced that is the right way for herself and hers to choose. And finally, there is quite a lot of emphasis throughout the painted life on the effectiveness of Mary's prayer and some of her insights. Here we see a sick cardinal. Mary is in one of the spa places to which she often went, here San Casciano in Italy. She arrives there for her cure. She finds that Cardinal Frescio in Ipanagua, a Spanish cardinal who is, has been well disposed to them, is also sick. And he, far from benefiting by the waters, is really seriously ill. So she goes on pilgrimage to San Giovanni, Monte Giovanni, a Marian shrine about 24 kilometers away. And she and her companions pray there for four hours. On her return, she finds that he's been cured. Another instance is rather earlier in her life because she's still on occasion going back from Flanders to England. And one such occasion is the Feast of St. James in 1618. She hears that a mutiny is broken out on the ship. And so she prays to St. James for help and calm is restored. And again, a meditation here, yeah, the meditation on the calling of the apostles. And notice the four men. This is Jesus appearing while the apostles are struggling with the storm at sea after the feeding of the 5,000. There is Jesus walking to them on the waters. Peter purposefully climbing out of the boat, ready to walk across the waves to him. Another person perhaps deciding he'll come as well. Somebody else hanging on to the mast, a very important job at this stage because it looks as if the boat is falling to pieces. And here is somebody else wondering what he should do. And in her prayer, she says, Methought they had no inheritance or resting place in anything of this world, and that thereby their affection and consequently the whole man was entirely at their master's disposal. And she reflects on something that she'd seen earlier in her prayer. 
it seemed a friendly separation from diverse things of this world, so as they had no part in me, nor I in them. I could equally have or want, that is, lack them, see them and not love them, like them and not live in them, which takes us back to the just soul and the freedom to refer all to God. There's also a series of pictures to do with special graces that Mary received as she was making the prayer of the Corinth or a one Lent in various of the well-known Roman churches. Here is San Marco in Rome, good likeness of the fresco and quite a good likeness of the shape of the church. And Mary, praying intensely, is reminded of Jesus's words in the gospel. Can you drink the chalice that I am to drink? And shown that she is to have great suffering. So Mary, and again, two companions, and notice the freedom of this church without benches where groups come and go. And another smaller Roman church, Sant'Eligio, where she receives the grace to forgive enemies. And notice the animation of this scene, the variety of people. And so, six themes, not a life, but a portrayal of a person. Not so much what happened, but what does it mean? What does it mean to a person to seek God's will in her life, to be moved to follow always what he is asking of her? How does this spiritual life proceed through the events that happen. What not what happened, what does it mean? And finally, what does it mean for me in my own relationship with God? Do I have some experiences which perhaps recall things that happened to Mary Ward? Am I helped by her example in what falls to me to do?